Over the last several lessons, we've been exploring the rise of Rome, what we can call the Roman miracle. The fact that this small town, located on the hills next to the Tiber River, inland and in central Italy, would come first to dominate the Italian peninsula and eventually build an empire across the Mediterranean world, an empire the likes of which the world had never before seen. The foundation of Rome is, at least in tradition, ascribed to the year 753 BC. And the Romans lived under kings until 509, when they overthrew the last of their seven kings and established the Republic. This period, the Republican period of Rome, was one of the most fertile periods in the history of constitutions. It produced a system of mixed government that we'll continue to explore. Now we turn to the period that we call the Late Republic, the last two centuries during which the Romans lived under a Republican constitution. We'll examine the crises that this period saw, the crises of Republican governance that would eventually result in the overthrow of the Republican system and the reestablishment of a monarchy in everything but name, under the rule of one all-powerful emperor, the beginning of what we call the imperial period of Rome. To give ourselves some chronological markers, the Republican period begins in 509, when Brutus overthrew the last of the kings, and it lasts, we can say, down into the year 31 BC, when a great figure who had become known as the first emperor, Augustus, overthrew his rival, Mark Anthony, in a great naval battle at Actium. This is the Republican period. But the last two centuries or so of this period are demarcated out as a period in their own right within the history of the Republic, the Late Republic. It begins in, we can say, 201 BC, a monumental year in the history of Rome, when the Romans, under the leadership of their Republican system of government, defeated their arch rivals, the Carthaginians, in a second epic war, known as the Second Punic War, that ended in 201 and saw Rome become the unrivaled hegemon in the Western Mediterranean. The Romans not only survived the Second Punic War, they destroyed their rivals, the Carthaginians, and it began a period of Rome's rise to imperial dominance. Now, realize that Rome, even at the time when it establishes itself as a republic in 509 BC, is still an unassuming town. You would never have guessed in 509 that this small cow town would become a dominant world power. Rome was a small society, and the republic had its beginnings in a very small scale, relatively primitive kind of society with a very basic agricultural economy. This will all come to change over the course of Republican history. And the year 201 is a symbolic date when the Romans not only destroy the Carthaginians, but become an aggressive, outward-looking imperialist power. From that year, the Romans will quickly invade other parts of the Mediterranean, including the East Mediterranean, and come to dominate the Mediterranean world. Polybius, as we've seen, is brought to Rome as a hostage as part of this process of expansion into the Greek world, into the Eastern Mediterranean. And it's Polybius, as a witness to this expansion of Rome, who writes his histories precisely because he wants to answer the question, how did this people, in the space of about 50 years, come to completely dominate the Mediterranean world? This rise to power, though, had profound consequences on Roman society, on the nature, on the structure of Roman society. And these changes would ultimately destabilize the republican system of governance that was born in a period when Rome was a small, simple, agricultural town. The crisis of the late republic had its roots in the profound social and economic transformations that accompanied the rise of Rome to enormous power. These processes go hand in hand. Rome rises to dominance in the second century BC. And during the same period, Rome, precisely because she came to dominate the Mediterranean world, would see internal changes that would destabilize the Republic with its traditional mixed constitution based on tradition, on precedent. Think when you imagine this period, the second century BC, of the profound social and economic transformations in terms of a few very critical kinds of change. One of these is simply urbanization. The world of the ancient Mediterranean is a world of very small towns and villages. Almost all of the population lives in the countryside. It's made up of peasants and farmers and tenants and villagers. But the rise of Rome to power and wealth 
brought with it changes in the second century that included the urban transformation of Italy. Now, there were cities before, but even the greatest of these cities were very limited in scale. Classical Athens may have been no more than 100 to 200,000 people, and that was a large city. Rome, at the time of the Republic, is no more than a few thousand people. But during the second century BC, the city of Rome will become the single largest city that humanity had ever seen up to that point. And in fact, by the first century BC, as this process continues, the city of Rome will reach a population that many historians estimate to have been in the range of one million inhabitants. That makes it the largest city until London in almost 1800. That's a profound change. The growth of this, what's really a mega city, right in the heart of the Roman Empire. And it creates a kind of urban society, an urban environment that simply had never existed before. And as we'll see, this urban atmosphere becomes a new kind of challenge to the Republican system of government. The second kind of critical transformation that occurs in this period is the rise of the Roman slave system. Now, slavery is common across human history, and it had certainly existed for centuries at Rome. But it was a small-scale kind of patriarchal slavery in which most slaves live with the family in its house. But the rise of Rome in the second century saw the development of a truly new kind of slave system, the likes of which the world had truly never seen before. Large-scale plantation slavery that's based on a commercial economy. The rise of Rome to imperial dominance meant the rise of Rome to commercial dominance, and it meant that there was money to be made by exporting commodities into the markets across the Mediterranean. And in the second century BC in particular, we see the rise of great slaves-based villas, plantations, where commodities, especially wine, is produced en masse as a cash crop and exported all over the Mediterranean world. This means a new kind of farming, a new kind of commercialization, but also a new kind of labor system plantation slavery. And we'll see that over the course of the second and first centuries BC, the rise of this new slave system would also be a destabilizing element in the politics of the period, most notably in the form of great slave revolts. Truly some of the largest slave revolts in all of the ancient world happen in the Roman world in the second century and first century BC, culminating most famously in the revolt of Spartacus, a historical event that occurs in the first half of the first century BC. The third critical transformation in this period is a change in the nature and composition of the Roman army. When the Romans thought of their Republican army, they imagined a citizen's army, an army of citizen soldiers who were farmers during most of the year, but who served their country in arms as necessary. In the second century, this ideal of the citizen soldier who was also a farmer was increasingly undermined simply by the scale of the Roman Empire, by the ambitions of generals to conquer new territories, and by the length of campaigns, which made it more and more difficult for ordinary farmers to serve part-time as soldiers. And over the course of the second century BC, we see a gradual but distinct transformation in the kind of soldier that serves in the Roman army, increasing professionalization as campaigns became more distant as terms of service became longer, the Romans eventually turned to the use of professional troops, that is, soldiers who would serve long terms of service and couldn't keep their family farms, but would become increasingly long-term, real professional soldiers. And this progressively undermines the old ideal of the citizen farmer serving in the army. All of these transformations, the growth of enormous cities, the rise of slave-based plantations, and the changes in the nature of the Roman army would come to a head in one simple problem, the undermining of the small farmer. All of these changes made it difficult for the small farmer to survive in the way that they had in the early Republic. And certainly, these changes would contribute to a new kind of politics and a new kind of political problem that would fundamentally destabilize the Republic.